The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Jesus took Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain apart by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became dazzling white, such as no fuller on earth could bleach them. Then Elijah appeared to them along with Moses, and they were conversing with Jesus. Then Peter said to Jesus in reply, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. He hardly knew what to say, they were so terrified. Then a cloud came, casting a shadow over them. From the cloud came a voice, This is my beloved son, listen to him. Suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone but Jesus alone with them. As they were coming down from the mountain, he charged them not to relate what he had seen to anyone, except when the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what rising from the dead meant. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. In Pope St. John Paul II's first homily on October 22nd, 1978, the first homily he gave as Pope, he said, Brothers and sisters, do not be afraid to welcome Christ and accept his power. Help the Pope and all those who wish to serve Christ and with Christ's power to serve the human person and the whole of humankind. Do not be afraid. Open wide the doors for Christ. To his saving power, open the boundaries of states, economic and political systems, the vast fields of culture, civilization, and development. Do not be afraid. Christ knows what is in man. He alone knows it. So often today, man does not know what is within him in the depths of his mind and heart. So often he is uncertain about the meaning of his life on this earth. He is assailed any, by doubt, a doubt which turns into despair. We ask you, therefore, we beg you with humility and trust, let Christ speak to man. He alone has words of life, yes, of eternal life. A beautiful beginning to a beautiful and long papacy. And that's going to connect to something in a little bit. So, I'm sure many of you have probably seen the film Les Miserables, or the play, or seen it on Broadway, or something like that. I was actually in it when I was in high school. I was Javert. And the story of Les Miserables is a beautiful story of redemption and of mercy. The main protagonist, Jean Valjean, is shown great mercy by the Bishop of Guignard when he gets caught having stolen the Bishop's precious silver. And he returns to the Bishop with a couple of police officers, a couple of constables who say, you know, to, you know, to show, oh, he stole this silver, he has it, he must have stolen it. He's, he had been a criminal, he had just gotten out of prison. But the Bishop instead of rebuking him, instead of making sure that he was sent off to prison again, this time probably for life, he had mercy on him. And he said, instead, he grabbed a couple of candlesticks that were also silver. And he tells Jean Valjean that he had forgotten these, and so he must take them as well and be on his way to live a new life, a righteous life. And of course, in an incredibly emotional scene, Jean Valjean runs from there and doesn't really know what to do. He's conflicted. 
Having lived this life of crime, how could he be shown such great mercy? And so he resolves to no longer be prisoner 24601, but instead to be Jean Valjean. He accepts his identity as a beloved son of God. He embraces his faith, and he starts his life over. On the other hand, you have Javert, the guy I played, who was unable to show mercy, couldn't accept mercy or forgiveness, couldn't accept that one could change their life. He couldn't accept conversion. He only knew justice. He wasn't an evil man. He wasn't even really a bad man. But he was hard of heart. And he was unwilling to allow God to break in. He was unable to accept that anyone could change, including himself. And so, eventually, he commits suicide by jumping off of a bridge, having rejected God's mercy and love, and having lost hope. Now, Jean Valjean experiences a happy death surrounded by his family and his friends, by loved ones, having been reconciled to God. His story is one of love, of sacrifice, of redemption. And that can be our story as well. In the Gospel today, the transfiguration of Jesus, God the Father expresses his love for his Son. He reveals Jesus' most fundamental identity, that he is a beloved son. And this identity belongs to us as well. Jesus, being transfigured before Peter, James, and John, he appears in dazzling white, radiant with the sun. The light of grace, of mercy, of faith, shines out from him, and he is the very source of that light. But why do we read this reading during Lent? It might seem a little odd. Why now? Well, the reason we read this every Lent is that it gives us hope. It's a way of showing to us the light at the end of the tunnel, if you will. To show us what the goal is. That glorification and union with God. This story it prefigures Jesus' redemption, resurrection rather, and his glorification. And it gives Peter, James, and John a little glimpse of what we all will experience at the judgment. And it reveals to us our identity. See, Jesus is the beloved, the beloved Son. As members of his body, we are adopted sons and daughters in him. We, too, share in that identity. Pope Francis, at the beginning of his papacy, he did an interview with America Magazine, and he was asked a question, who is Jorge Mario Bergoglio? And his response was simple. I am a sinner whom God has looked upon. God looks upon all of us Just as he looked upon Jesus on the mountain of transfiguration, and he looks on us with love and with mercy. We are all sinners whom he has looked upon. And what happens to love when it meets sin, weakness, and suffering? We call that kind of love merciful love. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear we read in 1 John. Peter, James, and John were afraid. They were terrified because they didn't understand what they were seeing before them. But love casts out that fear. It's one thing, though, to know this in the mind, to, like, comprehend it intellectually, but to actually have this become real knowledge, knowledge of the heart, as as uh, uh, Blessed John Henry Newman would say, or as Father Gately in his study, the one thing is three that many of you might be doing right now, says. 
In order to do this, in order to go from head to heart, we have to examine our life. Cardinal Newman said, Survey your life and you will find it a mass of mercies. I can't say how true that is for me. It's amazing how merciful God is to us. If we just examine our life, even just our day, at the end of each day, look back on your day and say, where has God blessed me today? Where has he shown me his love? Where have I been showered with grace? Do that first. Then look at where you might have failed that day. Always start with the blessings, though. You know, in the image of divine mercy, a beautiful image and a beautiful devotion, we can see a very concrete way of merciful love, that merciful love of God pouring out like water and blood from the side of Jesus. And the rays that come out from his heart. The antidote for fear, the fear that the disciples felt, the fear that often we feel, is to say, Jesus, I trust in you. That's what it says at the bottom of that divine mercy image. It's the response to do not be afraid. That's what St. John Paul II started his papacy with. Be not afraid. He told us what we need to do in order to receive God's mercy and love. And he ended his papacy, amazingly, on the vigil of divine mercy, the feast that he instituted, that was brought into this world by St. Faustina Kowalska, whom he canonized, as a reminder of us of how to be unafraid. Jesus, I trust in you. We need to know the merciful love of God and let it, let it transform us and change our hearts in a way that Jean Valjean was able to be changed, but Javert was not. And I think that probably one of the best ways to do this is in confession. You can't get much more concrete than that. But many have had bad experiences of confession. Some of you might have a fear of going to confession. Oh, what's the priest going to think? How's he going to look at me after this? How could I possibly, you know, say hello to him after I've told him all of my sins? Well, the reality is you're probably not going to tell me anything I haven't already heard. And... The amazing thing is God's grace and his mercy work through the priest. I've never even been tempted to think differently about people after having gone to make a confession. Usually I actually forget everything that they said. I don't have a great memory anyways, and on top of that, God's grace allows me to forget it. But don't let fear rule your life. Don't let a bad experience that you may have had in the past with confession chase you away from God's sacrament of mercy. Come to confession. Bring all of those sins that you have on your heart that are weighing you down, that are help causing you to identify as something other than God's beloved son or daughter. Bring those to him in confession. And to make it even easier for you, as I said on Ash Wednesday, you get the Lenten special for penance, only three Hail Marys if you come to me. And the reason for that is that God is merciful. God has shown me mercy. He has shown all of us mercy. And the sacrament of that mercy is confession. Take advantage of it. Don't be afraid of bringing your sinfulness and your guilt before the Lord because he can heal you and he will only show you mercy, not judgment. To 
to receive that mercy, that merciful love, we have to break down the barriers of our sin. And so respond to your fear by saying, Jesus, I trust in you. And then live out that trust by conquering that fear with God's merciful love.